Shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus. You are such an amazing, glorious God. And Lord, thank you that we get to gather this morning here in this building. Lord, thank you for giving us the breath in our lungs, the strength in our legs to get out of bed, to get here, Lord, to commune with each other, Lord, that we can learn about you, and Lord, that we can serve you. Lord, I just pray that this morning, that through your spirit, Lord, as it indwells in those who call on the name of Jesus, that it would be able to help us with understanding and knowing what we are to hear today through Pastor Jonathan, Lord. So, Lord, use his words to mold and form our hearts so that we can live more fully, completely surrendered to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us also to grow closer as a community. Lord, you have drawn these people for a reason that come here every Sunday morning. Lord, help us to connect with each other more than just on Sunday mornings. Lord, help us to connect throughout the week when we are in need, when we're not in need, to help support each other, to help celebrate with each other, knowing the goodness of God. And Lord, so I pray for the small groups. Lord, I pray that you would draw people into them this year that you would use them as a way to draw closer to you and towards each other. Lord, I just pray that um, as we hear your word today, Lord, if there's things in our hearts that are holding us back from truly becoming followers of you, Lord, that you would expose them and help us to work on them, that we would draw deeper into you, for you are life, Lord. You are everything. And Lord, I just pray that as we surrender, as we learn, as we grow, that you would also then empower us to reach this world around us, starting with this community that's here in Gibbons, Lord, and Sturgeon County, and going forth out farther, sharing the message of Jesus, Lord, sharing the hope that we have because of Jesus and the cross and what Jesus did for us. And so, Lord, use this morning for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Much better. No? Oh, there, I can hear myself now. Right on. Good morning, everybody. What a gorgeous morning it is. Um, I have the honor of reading the Word of God as soon as I find my eyes. Um, if you'd like to follow along um, in the blue Bibles that are in front of you or under your seat, um, you can find it on page 1047. We're reading out of 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, and then into um, verse 2. So it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered through the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ, and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. And not only do I have the privilege of reading out of one of the books of God's Word, but I get to read two. Um, so if you want to um, go to 2 Corinthians 5, um, if you're in the Blue Bibles, it's on page uh, 995. Um, we're starting in verse 14, so 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 21. And it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live 
should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was rec reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore God's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the word of the Lord. Thank you, Devana, for reading that. And thank you to the worship team as well for leading us this morning and for, um, yeah, just doing such a, a wonderful job in um, just humbly bringing us before the presence of God. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have you guys doing that. Uh, well, good morning to all of you, and welcome to Sturgeon Lions Church. Uh, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Jonathan, and I'm the pastor here at the church. And, uh, you know, there's uh, this opening line in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was, what was he doing? He was hovering over the waters. This encourages me. Um, partly encourages me because have you noticed how the first creative act of God in scriptures happens in the midst of chaos? For those of us with young kids in the house running around, that is good news that there is order coming at some point. Life happens on the other side of chaos. But more importantly than that, you know, in our world today, uh, it can seem like the world's in chaos. Whether you're watching the news, or you're looking, scrolling through social media, or you're just talking to your neighbor about what's going on, uh, the world's in chaos in every which way it can seem. Well, you know, I can recall a few years back, um, my family and I, when we moved overseas, went internationally to go work with our denomination uh, mission agency. And it felt chaotic, to say the least, uprooting our family of, at that time, we had three little boys and we were taking them across the world into a totally different context, a place where we knew we were outsiders, we did not belong. And we'd heard that, uh, and we were aware that, you know, when you take kids across culture, that there's going to be transition and there's going to be bumps in the road and there's going to be struggles that they're going to potentially have because of those challenges. And so, we, we were aware of that and, um, you know, we knew that we would be going away for years at a time and then coming back to visit Canada and to visit churches and family and friends. And so when we arrived in uh, our new home in Central Asia and we sat down with our boys and we said, you know, guys, um, this is our, our, our new home this new place here that we call our home. And of course, we have a home in Canada as well, right? Like we just moved from Canada. That's the country that we're from. And he said, but, but what, where's our, our true home? Where is our, our ultimate, truest home? And we taught them that our truest home is, of course, with God. Our truest home is in heaven. And that is our ultimate destination for those of us who follow Jesus. And so we, we, we taught them about that. Well, we were one day sitting with one of our boys, and he said, Mom, Dad, we have two homes. We have our home in heaven. We have our home here. And we have our home in Canada. And I thought to myself, well, okay, we've got the concept down right, but we've got to work on the numbers here with a little three-year-old son. But our home is not here. Our home is elsewhere. Well, the past couple of weeks, we've explored some of what the Bible has to say about who we are as the church. Right? We've looked at in past weeks how the church is a family, how we are, we are both a people and a place of belonging how we belong to one another because we first belong to Christ because of what he's done for us. And then last week, we looked at Paul's words uh, in 1 Corinthians 12 about how the church is a body, how we are this diverse yet unified kind of this organism like a body that works together, all the different parts working in unison together, and how we are called to bless and honor others with the giftings that God has given us. Well, this morning, we're going to close things up with this short series to start the fall by looking at how we as a church are sent ones. 
specifically looking at two words, how we are exiles and ambassadors. Now, it was unintentional, but I noticed that this, this short series that we're beginning our fall with, talking about, we began talking about this sense of belonging, this sense of family, this sense of being at home. And I recognize that it's a bit of a paradox here for us to end with looking at two words that actually take you away from home, in a sense, right? Exiles who are forced away from home, ambassadors who, if you know anything about diplomatic uh, relations and, and the way that it works, they are often living in a different country for months or years at a time to live and work and represent their home country in a different place. They're away from home. Well, earlier here, Devana read for us a portion from First Peter, and I want us to turn back to that right now. If you just open back up to First Peter chapter 1. By the way, as Peter's writing this, he is writing this uh, from Rome, and some think that, that it was written during a time of systemic persecution against the church in Rome. And he's writing to these believers in Asia Minor, in what is now modern-day Turkey, and he's writing to these believers who he is hearing about how they are experiencing persecution in their own world now, in their lives. And so he opens by saying this. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the God's elect exiles scattered throughout. He names all those different places that Devana read for us. Peter knows his history. He's a good Jew. He knows about this concept of exile and how deeply embedded and rooted it is, not just in his own psyche, but in his people, in the Jewish people. But more important than that, it's embedded in the scriptures, in the old, what we call the Old Testament scriptures, but what they knew as the scriptures at that time. And it is the history and story of God and his people, God walking with his people, even during the times when they were sent out away from their home to a foreign land for decades and centuries at a time. And so Peter comes to this word, exile, and this is how he starts by talking to these believers who are experiencing persecution, experiencing the challenges from the culture around them. And he's talking about, what he's really talking about is, is an experience, right? Peter's writing this, I think, in part because he's trying to help these Christians make sense of what they're going through. He doesn't want to have platitudes. He doesn't want to have cliches that he's going to spout off and say to them. He wants to bring them to this concept, this experience that God's people have always known all along, that this is not our home. The world as it is, is not our home. And so the exile is the perfect image for that. But Peter doesn't just stop there. He frames this exile. Look at verse 2 here. Verse 2. Peter frames this exile with this. So to God's elect exiles scattered. And then he goes on and he talks about how they are these uh, chosen ones. How they are not only chosen, but they are actually, if I just pull it up here for a moment, he is talking up to them about how they are uh, chosen and sanctified and how they are, uh, pull it up here. Right here in verse 2. It talks about how they are chosen to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This, this, this purpose behind their chosenness. And they're chosen for a reason. They're chosen to live faithfully to Jesus, in obedience to Christ. But then it goes further, and he says, for the um, sanctification of the Spirit, obedience to Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. So what does he do? He, he talks about exile, but he frames it with the gospel. He says, not only are you in exile, okay, so that's the, that's the bad news, if you will. Here's the good news, is that you are exiles who have been chosen by God. You have been set apart by God. You have been sanctified, this, this language of, of, of being set apart. And then you are now cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You are not just random exiles who have been forced out and who, who, have, who, who experience this, um, this experience of not being at home in this world, you are actually belonging to God. And so he points us through the gospel to where their true belonging is. You see, exile doesn't mean that you are forgotten. It doesn't mean that you were neglected. It doesn't mean that your future is set in stone, that, that, that the trajectory of your life is, is hopeless. He uses language like chosen, 
and sanctified and sprinkled. Peter is, is talking to people who are on the edges of their society, who are being pushed and marginalized by the culture around them. And he's trying to encourage them and tell them that even when things are at their worst, when things are at their most uncertain, that they, that you, that I, that we, as followers of Jesus, have a purpose in God and a home in God through the cross. He frames it with the gospel. This is, this is such good news. And part of the good news for us is that we are not bound or, or, or limited by our external circumstances. How many, how, how many, for us here, how many have said good news this morning? You are not bound, you are not limited by your external circumstances. God has more for you. He has a purpose for you. And you are defined by Jesus. You are defined by all that he is and all that he's done for you. Peter continues on in chapter 2, which Devana read for us as well, starting in verse 11. He, he goes back to this language of being foreigners and exiles. And, and, and the word for foreigner here can, it has these connotations of, I think some translations use the word alien. <laughs> Not like extraterrestrial, but like you're alien to this place. You're a stranger in this place. It, it fits well with the word exile. Here's what Eugene Peterson talks about in his message, this paraphrased version of the scriptures here. He says, friends, this world is not your home. It's not your home. But then he continues on, verse 12, back into the passage that we read. It says, live such good lives among the pagans. Live such good lives among the pagans. I'm going to switch here. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of he visits us. Our lives matter. The, the way that we live our lives, the, the way that we conduct our lives, the way that we spend our lives truly does matter. It's not just enough for us to, to pray a prayer and to then sit back and just wait for heaven. God is calling us to engage in this world in ways that are going to bring his life-giving presence and power to bear in the lives of those around us. Look at this here. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, that they may see your good deeds and glorify the God on the day he visits us. We, friends, are to live lives of such beauty and truth that we reflect the goodness of God to those around us. That's one of our callings. To reflect his heart, to reflect his character, to reflect his words and his actions and his promises that he gives us. You know, many people you've had conversations with them. Many people don't want to have anything to do with God. They don't want to have anything to do with Christians, with the church. And sometimes it's because of misconceptions about who God is, this feeling that he's let them down or that perhaps they feel like they're letting him down. Sometimes it's because they've had hurt relationships in a past in a church setting like this before. There's, there's, there's a bitterness there or, or a bad taste left in their mouth. Or perhaps it's because they have this idea in their minds of what Christians are like because of what other people say or what they see in the media. And Peter's telling those who, who are about to or who are facing persecution that part of their calling is to live lives that reflect God in such a way that even if or even when people malign them, slander them, accuse them of things, treat them cruelly, spread rumors, that those same people would see their lives almost like an on-ramp towards God, pointing to him. That, that consciously or even subconsciously, even as they are saying these things about these believers, that they would also intuitively know that this person is actually pointing them to the living God, whether they acknowledge it or not. You know, I want to be clear here. Um, you know, in the West, here in, 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 in Canada, we, we, don't, we don't face persecution, okay? We are living such good lives of, 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 of comfort and wealth and, and lives of sometimes um, influence even, if you will. Um, we don't face persecution. We might face certain disadvantages, certain challenges in our faith and in our walk. But we live from a very comfortable, sometimes privileged position. And I, one thing that I, I, I cringe at when I see, and I, I don't, I'm not saying I see this in, in, in you guys, but I see this just 
Christians at large in, in North America or in the West is sometimes people get this idea that it's almost like a persecution complex, that any kind of challenge or any kind of uh, adversity that they might face, automatically they start using this word persecution, or they start using language that lends itself towards saying that that's where we're headed. And, and you know what? I don't know where we're headed. Um, I don't know where the church is headed in the West and in our world in the years to come. Could we be there at, at a certain point? We could, yes. But we're not supposed to foster a kind of persecution complex, you know? If you, if you want to um, learn more about the persecuted church, actually, I want to invite you this upcoming Saturday. I, Redwater Alliance Church, just up the road, uh, Pastor Tony, they're, they're, they're hosting the organization Open Doors there this Saturday evening for a prayer event where they're going to be praying for the persecuted church. And it's open to anyone. I think you have to register online. So if you go to their website, you can check that out. But just a fantastic organization um, that really leads people in praying for our brothers and sisters around the world. So could things change for us? Yes, they could. They could. But even if they do, what would God say to us? I think he'd say something similar to what Peter is saying here to the church in Asia Minor. He'd remind us of our identity and our calling. I, I love how in verse 12, it's almost like there's this like cognitive dissonance going on here. Okay. You know, like when you, you, you think you have like a mental construct in your mind, you think something specific about a person or a thing. And then when you meet that person or you see that thing, it's completely different from what you anticipated. And there's like this jarring kind of, I did not expect that. Peter's getting into some of that here. That when, when, when someone who expects a Christian to be one thing, say they expect them to be intolerant or judging or critical or mean-spirited or killjoy, right? Like if you expect a Christian to be like that, and then you encounter someone who is exuding the life of God, the joy of Christ, who's exuding love and grace and peace. It can be a jarring experience that they don't know what to do with. You see, you and I as followers of Jesus are like aliens from another world. We don't make sense to people, and that's okay. And you know, in our world that expects and looks for us, they, people expect us to be intolerant. They expect us to be critical people of judgment, right? And they'll jump all over that. And sometimes <laughs> when we're being hypocritical, rightly so, right? Sometimes we need to be called out and people jump all over that. But when, when we showcase aspects of God's character, when we're, we can become like a, like a living invitation to others to step into the life of God. We get to represent God to the world. And this idea of representing God to the world, it, it gets talked about elsewhere in the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 20, this is what... Paul says, Paul's asking these believers, he is in prison as he writes this, and he says, pray for me so I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. An ambassador in chains. What do ambassadors do? They represent another nation in another nation, right? They, they are sent from their nation, from their government, and they go and reside in a different country, and they represent their home country. They, they conduct business, they negotiate, they build bridges relationally, right? They try to fix problems that have been ongoing, and uh, they support other expats that live in that country that they come from. And Paul identifies with this, but he doesn't just identify with this for himself. In the passage we read earlier here in, for, in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes to a different church in Corinth, and he says, Christ's love compels us. Why? Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What do exiles and ambassadors have in common? What do they have in common? They are sent out. They are sent out. Exiles are forcibly sent out, and they, they long for home because they're forced to leave. Ambassadors... I'm sure they long for home sometimes as well, but they are sent and their job is to represent their nation and they both know where their home lies. They know where their home is. For Paul, this role of an ambassador is directly tied to the gospel. This passage we just read right here. He's an ambassador of what? He's an ambassador to this, an ambassador to the work of Jesus Christ. 
And then in verses 18 to 20, he goes on to say this. He says, all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You know, one of the problems that we often run into is that far too often this idea of being sent ones doesn't always ring true for the Christian church. We don't always live up to that which we are called to. to. Instead of actively leveraging our alienness and our strangeness, instead of, of, of representing God in the spheres and, and arenas that we have influence and that we work in and that we uh, have relationships with, too often we can engage in culture in some unhelpful ways. And I just want to run through a couple of them right here. Some of this I got from Andy Crouch, who's a, a theologian and writer in the States, and a couple of the ones I've sort of just added in here as well. But he talks about this idea of how we as Christians are quick to criticize and condemn culture. Okay, we are a, we're quick to critique without humility and to condemn without offering solutions. <laughs> We just, it's like you're throwing rocks from a distance. You're lobbing grenades and you're not really offering a solution. We sometimes get in the habit of that. It's really, really easy in an area of, era of social media and of sound bites and of, it's just so easy to quickly just spout something off without even thinking twice about it. The second way that we can unhelpfully engage with culture is that we consume or we copy it. So this would be on the opposite end. If one is, is completely just saying, culture is awful, this, this, this. The other one is saying is just consuming it and just engaging with it. You go along with culture and participate in ways that are just, just blindly copying the way that the world lives. And we assume that because my neighbor lives this way or does this or has this, it's okay for me just to do that as well. So we can consume or copy. The third one is that we cower. This is, this is where we retreat or where we withdraw from culture entirely. It's, it's a, a self-preservation protection kind of mode that we can go into. And I think this is one that we actually see quite a lot in our Western culture, um, or in our Western church, I should say, right now, is a lot of people trying to withdraw and retreat away from culture and don't want to have anything to do with it whatsoever. It's almost like this bunkering sort of mentality. You, know, you dig a trench and you bunker in and you're just waiting for those, those shells to come your way. Well... I think it's worth asking Jesus, do I, do I lean towards any of these unhelpful engagements or disengagements with the culture and the world around me? Is there something here that is, Jesus is, is just pointing at and saying, not condemning, not shaming, but just saying, yeah, that you've, we've, we've engaged with that before. I know for myself, as I looked at this this week, I certainly feel like there's all three of them for myself at different points, <laughs> right? Even just in the last few months, I can look at points and say, man, did I really do that? Did I say that? Did I think that? Did I disengage in those ways? So do I sit at a distance? Do I lob critiques and condemn? Do I consume culture, engage with it in an unhelpful, unhealthy way? Do I retreat from engaging with it entirely? If we all live in and we contribute and we, we participate in the shaping of cultures around us, whether that's our family culture, church culture, or the wider culture around us. And when we look at the things that make up culture, when you look at the, the behaviors and the values and the attitudes and the customs and symbols and on and on and on it goes, those things don't just happen by accident. Those are things that, are, that have been cultivated. They have been fed and watered and stewarded over time. And you know, as people who are in the world, but we are not of the world, as the scriptures say, we are supposed to be people who are meant to cultivate a different kind of culture. We look towards, like I said, our home is not here. We look towards a different kingdom, a different world, a different place, a different culture. And so we are to live towards that end. The Bible talks about how we as believers are seated with Christ in, in the heavenly realms, in, a, in a, this spiritual reality, which is so mind-blowing, but we are seated with him. We are, we are in places of, of authority and influence, spiritually speaking, through Christ and his spirit indwelling inside of us. 
And in that sense, we have an opportunity because of what Christ has done, because of his indwelling spirit in us, to live in ways that reflect his heavenly culture, to reflect his values, to reflect his heart, to reflect what he wants to see happening. We're to live lives that cultivate a culture of heaven. You know, one of the best ways, or one of the best examples, I should say, that we see in scripture of proper biblical faithful engagement with the culture around us is the person of Daniel. And we don't have time to get into his story. It's, it's, it's a long book and there's many different elements to it. But if you're familiar with the story of Daniel, you'll be familiar that he is a young man who's taken away into captivity, into exile to Babylon. And he is then sent and he is trained up to serve in the ruling administration in Babylon. Right? So he's not a, a prisoner in the sense that he's in this cell. He's not forced into forced labor, but he is trained up to actually serve the king in Babylon. What does Daniel do? He doesn't criticize and condemn. He's not lobbing rocks or starting a rebellion. He doesn't join them in their entirety and just copy and consume the culture around him and join in with the Babylonian uh, pagan faith. He doesn't uh, you know, he, um, he doesn't attempt to run away or to disengage or to try to retreat away from things, but he faithfully engages and he sees God do some amazing, amazing things. His relationship with God, his trust in him and allowing God to work through him enables him to become such an asset to the Babylonian kingdom in the midst of one of the most pagan of environments you could imagine. And there is this artistry about how he goes about that. It, it's a true work of an artist. There is this creativity and this imagination that he allows God to speak through him to envision a future, not that he sees, but that God sees for this people and this place. He shows us, Daniel shows us, what it is to engage in a world uh, as it is, to be courageous, to not be easily offended, how quick do we get offended by the world around us, right? He shows us how to not become riddled with anxiety in the midst of darkness and in the midst of confusion. And he shows us how to not allow our faith to become compromised or diluted despite the influences around us. You know, one of my favorite authors and certainly favorite artist of mine is a, an artist named Mako Fujimura in New York City. And he writes this, he says, we must trust that the spirit is already at work in whatever darkness it is that you see around you and live your life that it might be used by God to shine his light. Mako works in a very dark uh, realm within the artist community in New York City and across the United States and around the world. And yet he has such an influence and such an effect in those places because of his engagement, his faithful engagement with the culture around him. We as believers are not supposed to look into the darkness and shout into the darkness. We're meant to carry a torch into the darkness, the light of Jesus into our world. And so I think it's appropriate for us to think about ourselves, this ragtag bunch of exiles and ambassadors, these weird aliens, these strangers, to embrace those identities with the postures of an artist and maybe even the posture of someone like a gardener or a farmer who cultivates things. Part of our work as far as a Jesus in this world is to dream with God to see what does not yet exist, to see what doesn't exist in the world around us and to allow God's life to influence things towards that, towards things that God wants to do. So I want to offer just a couple suggestions on how we can cultivate that in some ways that we can start that. It's not a comprehensive list of engagement by any means, but hopefully it's going to spur us on. And I think if we can see ourselves as exiles and ambassadors, these sent ones, and assume these roles with humility, oh, God's, God's going to bring transformation into our communities. And I think it's inevitable because it's Jesus at work through us. So here's the first one that I want to share with you. It's the practice of hospitality. We've talked about that a little bit here over the last year in some different ways. But I was reading a book by Christine Pohl on hospitality. And she writes that hospitality is a fundamental expression of the gospel. It's not merely being good 
at hosting or entertaining people, but it actually is all about welcoming the strangers and the outsiders to become a part of the life that is within the community. Sharing meals, opening your homes, transcending normal barriers. Um, some of you will be familiar with the theologian and, and Christian apologist Francis Schaeffer. Back, he died several years ago, but he was working a lot back in the 70s and 80s um, in Switzerland, where he had set up this um, center called Labri Center uh, for Faith. And it was, it was a place where they had conversations surrounding faith and culture, and it was a place for people to encounter Jesus, to have these, these open conversations and yet he would always point them to Jesus. And one of his biographers said this, you know, we, we, if you've heard of him before, you would have known he was an intellectual man, he was an apologist, he would defend the faith. But the thing that people who came to know him, who visited his, his center, they would say this, they talked about this overwhelming kindness that resided in the home. And their, their stories were listened to, their questions were heard, their doubts and concerns were considered, and the gospel was shared openly with invitation. True hospitality is this. It is kindness and it is an openness to the people around us, despite where they're coming from, despite the, the risk that might be involved with that, to welcome them into life of God. And it would, it would certainly be safer to not be hospitable. It would certainly be less riskier to not be hospitable. But God is calling us to be a people who invite those in. And so as we settle into fall rhythms, as you get involved in small groups, uh, practice hospitality. Have people over to your house. Uh, invite people to connect with you in different settings and, and share life with one another. In particular, do so with those who are on the outside or who are the most vulnerable. Paul says that almost all who practice hospitality insist that the demands of hospitality can only be met in sustained, strong lives of prayer and solitude, which leads me into my second point, which is prayer. Leaning into and depending on the presence of God in our lives, you know, being connected and in, communing, in communication with him, communing with the living God, making sure that that's a part of our daily lives together, uh, making sure that, or, or our daily lives um, in our own personal faith, but then also making sure that weekly we are getting together with other believers to do so. One of my former ministry colleagues, when we were living in Germany, they used to talk about how everything that we do in ministry, and they weren't just talking about those in vocational ministry, but they're saying, we as the church, everything that we do in ministry must be sustained by prayer. It ignites and it fans the flame of God's work in the world, and nothing gets done without it. And so we're to be a people of prayer. You know, if you were to, to go back to Ephesians 6, 20, when, when Paul is asking for prayer, why is he asking for prayer? He's asking for prayer so that he can be that ambassador of the gospel to the world around him. He knows that prayer is vital to his role. And the third thing is to enter into uh, creativity and imagination. You look at certain writers out there over the years, whether it be a, a C.S. Lewis or a, a Dorothy Sayers and others who produce these, these works of excellence. And, and they're, not, they're, not just, they're not excellent because they're, they're Christian. It's not like they, 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 they slap a Jesus fish on there or they try to, to quote scripture or something, but they just produce excellent work and their faith shines through in that and is a light to people who are reading it. There's many um, you know, painters and artists in this room that we have farmers and gardeners. We've got Craig, our landscaper, who loves to, to use creativity and imagination. But this is not just limited to the arts, this creativity and imagination that, that we're called to. This is, this is for any and all of the domains and areas of responsibility that you and I have in our lives. Uh, Andy Crouch, who I mentioned earlier, who helped me kind of put that list together of criticizing, condemning, and, and the like. He talks about this dual notion of an artist and a gardener. And he talks about how we're to take up the posture of that and how they have a lot in common. He says, both begin with contemplation, paying close attention to what is already there. The gardener looks carefully at the landscape, the existing plants, both flowers and weeds, the way that the sun falls on the land, and the artist regards her subject and then her, her canvas and paints with care to discern what she can make with 
them, this, this dual notion of artist and gardener. Oh, I opened with, with words from Genesis 1, and I want to close there again here before we jump into communion. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I recognize, friends, that our, our culture is warped, and at times it's dark, and it's confused, and it's lost. I, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a dad with four little kids. I'm keenly aware of what's out there. And our world is certainly chaotic, to say the least. And yet, when I read the scriptures, and we just did it, such a brief little survey of a couple of those words, but when we look at the scriptures, I can't help but see a God who does his best work in the chaos. A God who takes these black, churning waters, and what does he do? He forms a garden and a, life, a world teeming with life. Do you, do you see those dark, churning waters around you? Do you feel that? Can you smell it? Can you hear it? But more importantly, do you see how God is calling you and I, he's calling us to step into that chaos, to be adaptive and creative and resilient in his presence and in his strength? Do you see it? Do you see it? Yeah, he's calling us to bring his heavenly perspective into our world. I want to invite our worship team to come back up right now. And as we do so, I want you to just take a moment with me and just close your eyes. How is the spirit of Jesus perhaps speaking to you this morning, this moment? I take a moment and, and ask him. What does he say to you? What does he highlight to you? What is he asking of you? How do you feel like one who's in exile? How do you see opportunities as an ambassador? Ask him. You know, part of our culture as followers of Jesus includes gathering around and taking symbols of bread and grape juice. Fujimura writes this. He says, when we partake in communion, it's not a static act of remembering. It also calls us to envision what God promises he'll do in the remaking and redeeming of our world. <laughs> I love that. You see, when we enter into a time like this, where we are going to participate in something so simple as eating bread and drinking a little bit of grape juice, this powerful reality of Jesus comes Usher, is ushered in and, and, and is brought into this space and into our minds as his presence takes up residence around us. The ultimate new creation, the resurrected Jesus, is at hand. Or I guess more, perhaps more likely, in our hands. And he calls us to take and to eat and to drink and to remember him. And yet to also look forward to what's to come. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5, we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, if you trust in him, this is, this is open to you. This is open to anyone and all who trusts in Jesus. And why did, in part, why did Jesus do what he did? He did so, so we could be a part of reconciling this world to him. He wants to use you and I to reconcile the world to himself, and he commissions us to bring that news of reconciliation to the world. This is also an opportunity, by the way, as we gather around the table, uh, we do this every time that we have communion together, is, is uh, a special offering is taken up for our benevolence ministry, and this is a, a ministry in which um, we use the funds for that to, to bless those in need in our church family and in our community those who have various needs. And so if you'd like to give towards that, uh, there's a box in the back that you can, you can do so. And I'm just going to ask that everyone will hold on to the bread and cup you know, as we um, hand that out. I'll invite the ushers and, and elders to come forward for us to, to disperse that. Hold on to that until everyone's received it, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll partake together.